Today, I'm also joined by Jeremy Asseli from the Royal Wallenberg Center, Michael Levitt, FSWC CEO, and of course, our wonderful guest speaker for today, Pinkas Guter. To begin, Jeremy will offer some opening remarks. Jeremy Asseli is the Communications Coordinator at the Royal Wallenberg Center for Human Rights. Growing up in Montreal, he's always been devoted to addressing society's socioeconomic inequities and the ongoing climate crisis, a purpose which led him to volunteer both while away at university and at home. As an academic, Jeremy researched and wrote on matters relating to human rights and the climate crisis. He's focused particularly on the nexus between intergenerational justice, climate change, and the erosion of democracy the world over. We're thrilled he's here with us today. Welcome, Jeremy. Thank you, Daniela. And uh, thank you to friends of the Simon Wiesenthal Center for co-hosting this important series with us. We're proud to partner with you on this and many other important initiatives in the pursuit of justice. Um, and on behalf of the Raoul Wallenberg Center for Human Rights, I want to personally thank our audience for joining us here today. Our center's mission is and has always been inspired by Raoul Wallenberg. Uh, he was a, a non-Jewish Swedish diplomat stationed in Budapest during the Holocaust. He's single-handedly credited with saving tens of thousands, if not more, Jews from one of the Nazis' most brutal killing fields. As we like to say at the RWCHR, he demonstrated that one person with the compassion to care and the courage to act can prevent evil and transform history. One of the pillars of our center's work focuses on preventing genocide, much like what's currently happening against the Uyghur people at the hand of Xi Jinping's China. That's why opportunities like these to hear testimonies of survivors is not only important and timely, but necessary for the prevention of future genocides. I'm honored to be here today to witness and hear the story of Pinkas Guter. And on behalf of the Raoul Wallenberg Center for Human Rights, I wanna thank him for sharing his story. Thank you and enjoy the program. Thank you so much, Jeremy. We appreciate you being here and for ongoing support and the partnership with the Raoul Wallenberg Center. At this point, I'm gonna turn over the stage to our wonderful guest speaker for today, Pinkas Guter. Please give him a warm welcome. Pinkas, the stage is yours. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I am going to start off by uh, telling you a little bit about uh, my life before the war, some of it, of course, during the war and uh, post-war. I was born in the city of Łódź, uh, which is the largest, uh, which was the second largest city in Poland uh, when I was born. It was a textile city, and it's very important for me to explain to you the demographics of the city for the, for, for the future, which I'm going to talk about. Uh, there were 750,000 people living in Łódź in, in 1939, of which 250,000 were Jewish, Polish citizens, Jews, and uh, there were 100,000 ethnic Germanic speaking people left over from the times when Poland was divided between the Prussian, the Russian, and the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And they actually started a very big textile industry in Łódź, and they were a very important part of the, they were Polish citizens, ethnic, from et, et, the ethnicity was originally Germanic speaking, and they were a very important part of the city of Łódź. The rest of the people, apart from the 100,000 you know, ethnic Germans and 250,000 you know, Jewish people, the rest were Christian, mostly Catholics, but all, of all different denominations. I was born into a family of very religious Hasidic Jews. Uh, we were a very large extended family of about, I would say, 150 aunts and uncles, and great uncles, and all kinds of uh, uh, different uh, you know, cousins and, and the people that married into the family. Uh, but our immediate family, my, my own personal immediate family, was very small because my mother had twins. I had a twin sister, and my mother couldn't have any children afterward. And we lived together uh, in two little apartments in the center of the city, uh, bit, uh, in Wuj, uh, together with our grandfather and grandmother, my father's parents. And this is how the family was made up. Let me tell you a little bit about my life before the war. When I was about, uh, our family were winemakers. So according to the 
to my grandfather who had the parchment where he uh, gave the genealogy of our family. We were winemakers in Poland for something like 400 years. Uh, so how, do I, how did I start my life? I was a religious little boy and we started studying the Old Testament very, very early. So when I was about three and a half, three or three and a half years old, I don't remember exactly how, how old I was at the time, I was, but I was around about three, three and a half. And uh, my grandfather took me to a little school where I started studying the Hebrew Old Testament. And I started um, also be taught how to become a person who is going to be a productive individual, a worker. And my father, about six months later, took me down to the cellars and started teaching me how to be a winemaker. So I had a very happy, I would say I had a very happy childhood before the war. Uh, we had our festivals. Uh, we, we, uh, I don't remember too much anti-Semitism. I will just tell you one particular in instant uh, where uh, which, which happened to me, which made an impression, which of course uh, it's still, I still remember it to this day, but it, in, in actual fact, I don't remember suffering uh, because I was being a Jew. I felt I was a very happy child. And, um, you know, and I, and I, you know, we, as I said, we, we had a very, you know, my sister and I, we were very, had relation, good relationship with my grandfather, of course, living next, next to us in the two little apartments with the interleading door. So everything was, was, was very, was hunky-dory as they say in English. But let me tell you the instance of antisemitism that I experienced before the war. Uh, when I was about, I, by that time I already, you know, I could read and, and, and write both Polish and Yiddish and I knew smattering of, of, of Hebrew, uh, I became very ill with double pneumonia. And pneumonia at that time was a very dangerous illness. It was, there were no antibiotics. But our doctor, who I still remember his name, Dr. Herschwinkel, managed to get sulfur drugs from Vienna. That's what I was told at the time. And uh, I started recovering. It took me quite a long time to recover. And when I recovered from the illness itself, uh, I was sent into the mountains in Shavnitsa. Shavnitsa was on the border between uh, Poland and then Czechoslovakia. Today it's Slovakia and the Czech Republic, but then it was Czechoslovakia. And Poland is a very flat country. It mostly forests a lot, agriculture, and it's got one range of mountains, big mountains, and that is between the border. They call them the Tatra Mountains. And you send people there to recover from illnesses of the lungs, they get fresh air. They, uh, they drink special waters and I was sent there to, to run. And I was a very happy child, why? Because I didn't have to say my prayers, I didn't have to study, I didn't have to go to school. I could just play all day. I lived together with the Polish Gurale, you know, Catholic uh, mountain people in huts together with the animals. And I loved animals and I loved every, that whole area. So I spent uh, quite a few months recovering, you know, building up my lungs. I was always very interested in sounds. Music to me was, the, I, we had no great musicians in our family, but I loved music. So in Shavnitsa, there was a park and in the park, there was a bandstand. And on Sundays, the uh, band, the local orchestras, the, uh, the army, the police, the fire brigade, some schools would come and play in the afternoon and I would run out on the mountain and I would sit on the grass and listen to, to, to the music. As a matter of fact, some parts of it are still playing in my mind because I've got a, a photographic memory. So I remember everything. As a matter of fact, after the war, uh, not recently when I went back to Poland, uh, the first thing I went is I went to Shavnitsa to see if everything was still there the way I remembered it. So what actually happened one day on the way back after the concerts finished, I would go back to the mountain and I would go past the church. Now, Poland is a very religious country. And uh, so the church 
there was mass in the evening of Sunday. So I would stand outside because as a little Jewish boy, I knew I couldn't go inside. So I was just standing there and I was listening to the wonderful sounds that came out of the choir and of the organ. And it was just wonderful. I didn't know whether it was Mozart or Bach or Beethoven, or who, who was playing, you know, what music was all about. But to me, it is, was almost like a dream. I really loved that music. So I would stand outside normally. One day, I was so enamored of this and, and kind of almost in a, in, a, in a dream that I walked slowly towards the church. I didn't go inside, but I knelt on the first step you know, there were three or four steps going into the door of the church. I knelt on the first one. And I was there, I don't know, for a little while. And suddenly, somebody hit me at the back, and I looked around, and there was this middle-aged man who was shouting at me and saying, how dare you Jewish uh, lepros, kind of in Polish, he says, uh, you know, how you contaminate the soil of our Holy Mother, because uh, uh, the Holy Mary is the actual patron saint of, 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 of Poland. So this is something that I experienced before the war. And they were like in, the, in, in Łódź itself, when I was going to school, uh, you know, little boys, Christian boys would shout, Zidi the Palestine, Jews go to Palestine. But otherwise, I didn't experience anything. And this is how life went on. You know, Saturdays we celebrated the, the, the Sabbath and, and the, the holidays and everything was, was, was wonderful. And that all changed on the 1st of September in 1939, when the Germans attacked Poland for no rhyme, for no reason, except that's what they wanted to do. Nazism was going to conquer the world. They arrived in Łódź within I would say seven or eight days. Uh, they, they were very quickly in, in Łódź. And as soon as they arrived, they started all kinds of uh, rules against Jews. That's the first thing they did. So if you, had, if you worked for the government, or if you worked in a bank, or if you, had, if you worked for, a, for any kind of uh, big company, you were kicked out of the job. All Jew, Jews, block. can you imagine 250,000 Jews living there? A lot of them were very poor. Most of them were actually laborers working in the textile industry. And they all, they suddenly, they were kicked out. They couldn't work anymore. They, they were kicked out. And what's more, they, for example, you, they frozen your bank account and you could only get so much, very little a, a week. They, uh, you weren't allowed to use public transport, you weren't allowed to do anything. And another thing, the most important of all, is that anything that you had of your own was confiscated. For example, if you were a tailor and you had a small establishment where you were made clothing for people, or if you were a shoemaker, or if you had a convenience store, or, or any type of, 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 of something that you were making a living, you were kicked out. And you remember that I told you that there were 100,000 ethnic speaking Germans in, in Łódź. Suddenly, they became the Herrenfolk. They put their swastika in their lapel, little kind of uh, uh, things with, with the swastika, and they were the ones, they could come in to a, a convenience store, kick out the Jewish owner, and take it over, no compensation, no nothing. And things became very, very difficult. There was uh, a special, uh, special rules for, for Jews. For example, there were special hours where the Jews could come be, the, uh, you know, dif difficult, di different to everybody else. Uh, you, when you saw a German speaking person, you had to take off your head and it was really getting very, very bad. Uh, the war was still raging, it wasn't finished and they, uh, the Nazis, the security services that came behind the German army, they had lists of notables, not only Jewish notables, priests, rabbis, uh, Poland had the nobility, the counts and dukes and others, uh, government employees, high employees, the mayor of the city and the high government officials, they were arresting everybody. And they had a fifth column 
before the war, because amongst those 100,000 ethnic Germans, and I'm not saying that all of them were collaborators, majority were, and they took advantage of it. So they put up lists for these Gestapo and the security service of who might give them problems. My grandfather was a notable uh, because he was in charge of an NGO, a seminary where they taught people to become rabbis. So he was on one of those lists, which obviously they got from the Jewish Community Council because there was always community organizations. So they, they got that. Now, my grandfather was 78 years old and he just had an operation on his kidneys before the war started, about, about a week before. So he was lying in bed. Now, you remember I told you we had two little apartments with the interleading door. My father was at home, nobody was working, the war was still raging. And my father didn't even know what he could do. But uh, anyway, there was a ring at the bell of my grandfather's door. My father went through uh, the, the, the connecting door, opened it, and there were two security Gestapo men, all dressed in black, and they asked for my grandfather. So my father took them into the bedroom, which was very, it was a very small apartment. It was just one, one room and a little kitchen in a, in a bedroom. So he, he was sleeping in the bedroom and they said, what's the matter with him? And he told them that he was sick and he is very ill. Uh, so they decided that they weren't going to do anything to him. They kind of, one of them, I actually understood the time. And he said it in German, and because of Yiddish, I understood what he meant. He meant that, you know, he will, you know, he'll kind of die soon. So we won't bother with him. They asked my father, who are you? I, he said, I am a son. What do you do? I'm a winemaker. Oh, where do you make wine? Novomieska number 19. They took him down to the cellars where I used to go and study how to become a wine master. And they beat him so badly that they thought that they killed him. They threw him into a corner. They went upstairs. They called the military police of the German. And they said that all the trucks that are going to the front, they must uh, just come, come, come into the cellar and help themselves to all the bottles of wine, whiskey, whatever was ready. And then when they finished, they actually broke the vets that were maturing. And they, 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 they even uh, they, you know, took it in jerry cans. And after about 24 to 48 hours, maybe a day or two, they destroyed something that I have got records today, which I received not so long ago from, from the government institution in Poland, that these, this business, uh, which was called Zwarte Gronold, Golden Grape, existed, these sellers existed. I don't know if the name was always the same, but these, uh, these sellers where the wine was being made by our family existed close to a hundred years. So that was destroyed in no time at all. The caretaker of the unit uh, saw them taking my father down. He, they went down together with him. When they all left, and they and, and he because he obviously he was very scared. So when they all left, and he didn't see my father come out, he went down to find out what was the what was going on with you know with my father. What happened to him? And he found him lying in a corner. And he went and looked at him. He wasn't dead. He was unconscious. So he put, put him on his shoulder and he carried him to our apartment. And my father was unconscious for about seven or eight days. And the same doctor that treated me, Dr. Herschwinkel, treated him. And after about seven, eight days, he recovered his conscience and he, be, he, he became, you know, he became better. And so, slowly he recovered. By that time, the war was over and Poland was divided between the Russians and, and, the, and, the, and the Germans. And things were getting from bad to worse. They started, they put up together a Jewish council. They started taking people for slave labor and we were blonde and blue eyed. My, my mother, my grandfather from my mother's side was a farmer. You know, people say there were no Jewish farmers in Poland before the war, that's what they tell you. But that's not true. There were a lot of Jewish farmers and my grandfather was a farmer. And I know because I used to go to the farm. I even went in 38 to a wedding of my uncle, uh, you know, or to, on the farm. And he had a farm 
where they he had ho horses and, and, and I used to love horses and, and it was it was a wonderful place. So my father decided he had a younger youngest his, his youngest sister uh, they they were five five siblings so his younger sister married somebody in Warsaw and because Warsaw was going to be part of a kind of rump of Poland and Łódź was going to be incorporated into Germany itself uh, he decided that we would go as Christians because Jews weren't allowed to go to the train or take any public transport and that must have been around about the end of November or middle of December I know it was it's before the end of 1939 so they cut my little side locks off and I cried because I didn't want them to let them. And we got dressed like, you know, everybody else got dressed. My, ma my mother was a very beautiful, blonde, blue eyed, Scandinavian looking woman. She was tall. She was five foot ten. She was very beautiful. And she took the two children, my, 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 my twin sister, too. And we went to the train station. We bought tickets and we went as Polish Christian to Warsaw. Uh, where my uh, aunt, my father's younger sister, lived. My father, who, you know, had a little beard, I know he cut a lot of it uh, off, but he still kept because he was sort of so religious, he wouldn't cut it off completely. We spoke absolutely pure Polish, like every Polish Catholic, because, you know, I, came, I used to go to the farm and my mother came from that area. So we, she taught us and we spoke Absolutely, nobody could recognize that we were Jewish, especially as we were blonde and blue-eyed, so-called Aryans. So we could get away with it, but not my father. So he walked. By that time, there was a border between uh, between Łódź and Warsaw because that part was incorporated into the German Reich. And and he took him about two and two and a half months to actually arrive in Warsaw. Well, let me tell you, Warsaw was no better as far as Jews were concerned. Jews became outlaws. You could do anything you wanted to them. If you were walking in the street and you were a Jewish person, and in Warsaw there were 350,000 Polish Jewish citizens living there, uh, anybody, not, not necessarily even a German, but anybody would come and take everything from you, beat you up, and the police, the Jewish, the, the Polish police, which collaborated, the, the, what they called the Polish Blue Police, the Policia Granatowa, they didn't, they weren't interested. If you went to complain to them, they just pushed you. They also kicked you away. They were now collaborating with the Germans and they re regarded Jews as something which is, were outlaws, as I told you. So there was no recourse to anybody. And uh, my mother had an idea. She decided, you know, there were lines for people to buy goods in shops. And it was very difficult for a Jew because he stood in line. First of all, he would stay there for a long time and only after everybody was served would he go in. By that time, there was very little left for him to buy, whether he went to a bakery or he went to a grocery. I mean, it was very difficult to, to get food. So my mother had an idea. Uh, by that time, I was eight years old or going on eight. And she said, I will give you the money. You go uh, and uh, go to the line and nobody's going to stop you. You, 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 you. you look like a Polish little boy or even maybe an Aryan. So I went with a little rucksack and I went to, uh, to, to the line. And of course, a little good looking little boy, they pushed him straight to the in front. They weren't going to let him stand there. And I went in and I could buy. By that time, there were 17 people of our family who came. Some of them ran away from Wood, some from other cities. And they were living in that small apartment of my aunt Sabina uh, in Electrana number 14 in Warsaw. Uh, that, and that's where we were until my, uh, uh, my father arrived after a two, two and a half months walking. He was walking at night and during the day, friendly farmers or forests he would die in the forest, cover himself with leaves, and that's how he arrived. But the time, so when he arrived, of course, he had to. We had to make a living to 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 because money was running out and and there was very little. And he was a winemaker; he couldn't do anything else except wine. Anyway, 
he was very fortunate at that time. He found a little apartment in, in a building on, um, on Nalevki number 49, corner Miller Nalevki. And I'm telling you that now because it pays, it, 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 it plays a, a part of my story. And uh, the front of the building was destroyed by a bomb when they were bombing Warsaw because Warsaw held out for a whole month. And then, but the rest of the building, the west of the quadrangle, because Polish buildings are quadrangles with, with a courtyard in the middle, with a park or kind of grass and, 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 and things inside. So the front was destroyed, but the rest stood. So he found on the second floor, uh, he found a little apartment, a one bedroom, small bedroom, and a little kitchen with the, with, with the facilities in, in, the, in, 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 in the hallways. You know, there was a, and, and this is where we moved in. My father bought a, uh, a little barrel and he started, he bought raisins. You can make wine from anything, but he bought raisins so that because you, you to, to make wine, he started making wine from these raisins. And, and I, this was before the ghetto started. There was no ghetto in, in Warsaw for quite a while. And he sent me out with the same little rucksack to go out to cafes and they throw out the bottles for me to collect the bottles. And he would take off the labels and, and put water into it uh, to, to clean all these things. And he bought uh, corks, obviously on, everything on the black market by that time. And he started making wine. And on Fridays, because Jews make a, a special blessing on Friday night, there were still quite a lot of Jewish people who had money. I mean, this was before everything started greedy, going very bad. And uh, I would go with my rucksack, he would give me addresses, and I would deliver uh, the wine on Fridays or Thursdays. And then this is how he started making a living. And my mother in the same street, Nalevki, she got herself a little window and she started, you know, like a kiosk. And she started selling cigarettes and sweets. And this is how for about five to six months, she was, they were, were making a living. Then in November of 19, it started, they started building it before. They started talking about the ghetto, yes or no. And eventually they decided there was going to be a ghetto and they started building the walls. And then in November of 1940, the ghetto was closed and there were gates and Jews couldn't go out anymore. Christians could come in, but Jews couldn't go out anymore. And can you imagine when I'm telling you that 350,000, you know, Polish Jewish citizens were pushed into an area of less than 3% of the area of Warsaw. 350,000, almost a third of the population, there were a million and 350,000 people living in the area of Warsaw with its outskirts, and they were all pushed in. So by that time, the Nazis set up a Jewish community council with, with, with Chernyakov being the, the kind of the chairman of the council. He was a, 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 an engineer, a secular man, and then a Jewish police, a Jewish prison, a Jewish post office, a Jewish fire brigade, I mean, all the kind of things that you do for a normal municipality or a normal little town or something like that, except this wasn't normal. This was only something that they closed us in and every day the Gestapo would come and they would tell Chernyakov, the head of the council, what he needed to do. They set up factories outside you know, the ghetto and inside the ghetto, German entrepreneurs, and they started using Jewish labor as slave labor. They paid them very little and gave them a little food. And starvation and, 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 uh, and uh, illnesses started in the ghetto straight away. Immediately from 19, as soon as the ghetto was closed off and they pushed all these people, they, the Jewish Community Council uh, assigned so many people per room. So there's some, depending on how, the, how big the apartments were, there were five people per room, there were nine people per room, and eventually there weren't enough uh, rooms for everybody. So they opened all, all the halls, the synagogues, and they put people into it, and people became refugees, <laughs> like today, unfortunately, the Syrian refugees that run away from, 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 from home, uh, became uh, refugees in their own city. And they, they could only bring with them what they would carry because they didn't allow them 
some very wealthy people could to get a horse with a with a cart to somebody to bring some stuff. But every all the furniture and most of the stuff had to be left behind in their old apartments. So only those people that lived inside the ghetto before that could have something left. Now my father, you know, continued making wine, and my mother continued having the little kiosk for quite a while. And this is how we, we made a living. But at night, and because our apartment was so small, and because four of us were living there, and because the kitchen was about half the size of the bedroom, uh, uh, they didn't assign any more people. But my father, who was a very, very good man, he would go out and bring people at night, especially when it was cold, and people would sleep in the kitchen on the floor. And I remember that quite clearly. And I, saw, and I remember a lot of people slept my, my mother used to say sometimes, there was one man particularly who, who had a lot of boils on his face. And my mother used to be cross with my father because he would bring in, he said, the children are going to get sick and we won't have money for medication. But my father didn't pay any attention. He would continue bringing people and let them sleep because he was an extremely uh, uh, good man. My grandfather would say that he was such a good man, they would take off the shirt from his back one of these days because he was always very philanthropic. And this is how life went on. You couldn't do anything except what we were told by the Nazis. People started dying in the streets. Illness started, famine started. There were Jewish, there were Jewish organizations like the Self-Help Society who started with kitchens. They started going to certain Jews uh, that had money and collect money. The community council also started making kitchens, but that wasn't, that was only good enough for a plate of soup and a little piece of bread. And in the meantime, slave labor, every day, a lot of people were taken for, to slave labor. Sometimes they would take them for weeks at a time. They would take six, 7,000 people at a time. And when, and, and then they, and they would, you know, beat them while they were working. By the time they came back, half of them were almost, you know, so ill, they were dying out. And this little boy was running around the streets. And so he saw scenes that you cannot imagine. For example, you know, I, I differentiate between Germans and Nazis. Why? Because I think maybe they are human beings. Human beings, not all of them are bad ones. But here, for example, Nazi officers in convertible cars would drive into the ghetto to show off to their girlfriends, uh, you know, the ghetto. And in the meantime, while they were there, whether they were drunk or not, they would take out their revolvers and they would shoot at people, you know, like you hunt animals. And these people, sometimes they would kill somebody, sometimes they would just wound them, and sometimes they would miss them. But in the meantime, that they disporting themselves. And then, of course, the Nazis started the black market because you can't live on, on the rations that they were allowed in the ghetto was less than a Mars bar. 180 calories approximately was the daily ration of a Jew living in the Warsaw ghetto. Well, this little boy again was roaming the streets, still, now collecting still bottles for his father, but in the meantime, standing out the, in, in cafes, outside cafes now, where the collaborators, there were Jewish collaborators, the Polish police, the Nazi uh, SS, they, they, you know, the ones with the black market, they, they would have uh, restaurants in the, in the ghetto. There were quite a few restaurants where they were dancing and drinking and uh, music was playing. And a lot of, a lot of people, were, were doing that. And there were a lot of collaborators and things, the Jewish police. I mean, I can't, I'm not blaming anybody, but I can only show you what I saw with my own eyes. And while I was standing outside the cafe, you know, where all this was going on, eh, there were also dead people lying there. And as 1941, was kind of going more, more and more people were dying. And one day I saw a scene which I've never forgotten. There were so many dead people lying in the street that the Jewish burial society who walked around with wooden carts collecting this, like you collect 
you know, garbage here in Toronto and just put them on. Some people were naked because uh, uh, people stripped their clothing uh, uh, and some people were covered with newspapers and they were just put it, throwing them on and then taking them to the, to the cemetery where the huge pit was dug and then throwing them in without prayer, without anything. And one day there were so many of them that they, the Jewish police caught men, gave them wheelbarrows and they were collecting them you know, like you go in the construction site and they were going with the wheelbarrows to the, to the cemetery and, and pitching that into, the, into that big, you know, it's unbelievable. And uh, today, if you go to the Jewish cemetery, uh, you can see that there were, that while the ghetto in its existence from 1940 to 1943, when the deportation started, close to 100,000 people dry, died in the Warsaw Ghetto of either disease or hunger or where they were, but there were shootings. There were also shootings all the time in the Warsaw Ghetto. They would surround a, a, a building and they would take out people. They would use all kinds of reasons why and they would shoot them and leave them. And this pit, which is, grew there, is actually today, and there's a monument in front of it. And when you go, you can actually see this, where this huge pit was on the, in the Jewish cemetery. This, this state of affairs lasted until the 22nd of July of 1942. On 1942, 22nd of July, placards appeared on the walls and the placards said because of unemployment, because of sickness, some people of the Warsaw Ghetto are going to be relocated. They didn't use deportation. They used the word relocated to the east where they're going to go. Your families can go together. Each one can take 15 kilo of their belongings and they can, uh, they're going to get food, three kilo bread and marmalade for the journey. And, uh, and they're going to have good life. They're going to live in, in, in places. And I don't remember exactly what the placard said, but I mean, those placards are actually today in the Historical Institute in, in, in Warsaw. If anybody is interested and goes there, I suppose they can see that. But I remember what the placards were in Polish, they were in, 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 in uh, you know, in, in German. And they, and, and they decided, they said, not everybody, only these and these, you know, unemployed uh, people living in the streets are going to go. And at the beginning, people went voluntarily because you know, they, they, they were in bad straits. They were offered uh, a new, new place, uh, food for the journey. So they volunteered and went to the Umstagplatz where the deportations were, uh, or the so-called relocations. In the meantime, the Nazis were playing games. They were issuing documents, all kinds of documents to people who were supposed to be uh, not being shipped out, who were going to be is staying in the Warsaw Ghetto. Now, if you had those documents, you felt you were safe. But my father, who uh, had a, uh, a uh, who actually, who had a, a nephew, who, who was a very, very, very well organized, and he could get these, all these documents. So my father got documents, but he didn't trust the Nazis, maybe because they beat him so much. So we never ever went down for document, document for, for the inspection of documents. And he always hid us. And he hid us all the time. So there was the first plot of deportation and there was a lull. And the Nazis were doing all kinds of funny things. What they did is they would surround a few blocks of uh, uh, buildings and they would say, everybody must come down and show their documents for inspection. And when people came down and they had documents that allowed them to stay because they were working or this or that on the other, they say, well, those documents, maybe they were gray or green or yellow, and I don't remember, they are not valid anymore. We are now issuing new documents and you are not uh, a part of that and you have to be relocated, you have to go leave. And by that time, you know, within a few weeks, people uh, started Find, listen, finding out what, where are these wagons are going? Where are all these people going? And what actually happened that at the Umschlagpark where they were trans, 
transporting these people, the Jewish police and some others, they set up a, a sick bay just to make it as if, as if everything was, was kosher and 100% and with doctors and things and, and you know elderly people. And if somebody got ill, they took him to the sick bay to make it sick as everything was, was, was okay. But they noticed that the locomotive and the, uh, you know, they all have numbers. The locomotive that left in, in the morning with about 60 wagons came back and these 60 wagons and the locomotives, you know, came back by lunchtime or just after lunch. So they couldn't have gone very far. As a matter of fact, they didn't go very far. And some of the people that were chosen in Treblinka, which we found out later on, to sort out the closing of the people that were being murdered there by guests, uh, they smuggled themselves in to, back to the ghetto with the train that came underneath the closing. And they told us, we are not going to be relocated to the East, you are going to, to die in Treblinka. That's what they, they set up the special guest chambers in Treblinka to kill all the Jews from the Warsaw ghetto. And a lot of people didn't believe them, but my father was one of those that did. That's why we lost it in the Warsaw Ghetto until the uprising on the 19th of April of 1943. And there was a previous uprising in January, a small one, and there was a lull, and there were always lulls in between the deportations. And, uh, and then by that time, you remember I told you that the front of the building was destroyed, it was in ruins, and that those ruins were never you know, taken away. So underneath those ruins, Kornel and Alevsky in 1949 and Mila III, they built a bunker underneath, like you build, you know, a mine with two trap doors, one in Mila and one in, in, uh, in Alevsky and for, for about 150 people. 19th of April was the eve of Passover. So just to show you how strong the moral rectitude of the Jewish people, their morality, their social, uh, uh, you know, responsibility, they, they, their spirit, they couldn't, they couldn't break them. Despite all these th things that were happening, it was terrible, but you couldn't break, you couldn't break them. You couldn't take away their, 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 their thousands of years of history. So my father, must have had a few bottles of wine left. So he took them down to the, to the bunker because we were told that, that the Nazis are coming now to take away the rest of the Jews and we were going to hide there. And, and the baker who was obviously baking during the lull between January and April, because of officially there were still some things going on. There were factories that were working, so they had to make food baked some matzos, and in that evening, you know, when they came in and they started shooting and the rebellion started and, and they started killing people in the streets and, 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 and doing all kinds of terrible things and chasing them to the Umstadtplatz with dogs and burning buildings down. We commemorated and celebrated the deliverance of the Israelites from Egypt, from slavery, praying and crying for deliverance. But they never forgot that. And I, I have never forgotten that, that night where there were close to 100 people in that bunker. We were in that bunker for about three weeks. I mean, from the 19th of April to the first week of May. And then we don't know how they discovered it because they, we, they built air vents, you know, they had to have air so they built air vents and they put them amongst the, the ruins. There were air vents to bring air in. During the night, they would open the trap doors and we would go out to get some air. But during the day, when the, when, when the Nazis were romping around and killing people and chasing them away to take them to Treblinka to die, they, they uh, 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 you know, we, we were in the bunker. But at night, we used to get out. But during the day, we had air from those air vents. Suddenly, in the first week of May, they were uh, through a megaphone. We heard a voice saying, if you don't come out in half an hour, we're going to say, we know you are in the bunker. We're going to throw uh, gas bombs and you're all going to die. So we came out and they all started to shout. There were these 
paratroopers with the machine guns on their chest shouting, hand the hole, hand the hole. And I remember very clearly, I don't know what made me think that then. And I was this little boy, I was very proud because they were scared of us. They said, hand the hole, Nick Sheeson. You, air up in the air, don't shoot, don't shoot. So these paratroopers in paratroop smokes with their machine gun were scared of us. Anyway, they chased us to the Umschlagplatz. We were there for two nights and a day. And you cannot imagine, they chased us into a little classroom, uh, as many people as they could. We stayed there all this time, no food, no water. You weren't allowed to go out. So everything, uh, women with children, nursing women, uh, 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 old men, everything was being done there. You can imagine what kind of apocalyptic hell was in that particular room. The Ukrainians who were the main uh, perpetrators, they stood at the, at the door. And if you took, if you had some jewelry or something of value, they would give you some water. So my father, I saw him take off my mother's uh, ring, wedding ring. He went to the door and he got, he got a bottle, a big bottle of water. He came back and he had a sock which he saved with a teaspoon with sugar. The sock was sugar. And he gave the children, my sister and I, a teaspoon of sugar and some water. They never touched it. After, after we were there, those two nights and the day, they chased us into the wagons. They pushed as many people as they could. My father was like an angel encompassing. He pushed us towards that little window with barbed wire so we could actually breathe because they pushed so many people in that you, you, get, you, could, you choked there. And we were taken and we thought we were going to die in Treblinka because we knew for quite a long time now in the Warsaw Ghetto we were in Treblinka. But our train finished up in Lublin which a, 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 also a death camp called Majdanek. And as we were chased out of the wagons, a lot of people in that wagon had already died because they, they, they couldn't take, the, they had no air or, or, or they were elderly. And so they took out the dead people and then they chased us out and they divided men from women, women from children, children without women, women with children, and there was unbelievable mayhem, dogs and shouting and shooting. And you cannot imagine. My father told me I was a head taller than my sister. We were twins, but I was quite tall. So my father said, say that you are five years older than you are. I was 11 and I think I told him I was 18. And he took me with the men. So I was with my father all the time. My mother was separated from my sister and I'm not sure how, but my sister saw her. So she was running towards my sister. And uh, she had this long blonde braid. So as she was running and she came to my mother, she hugged her. And uh, all I was watching was the braid. And since then, my brain did something that I cannot remember anything for the 11 years that we lived together. I cannot remember my sister's face or anything about her. I remember everything. I have a, 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 pic a picture, I have a memory. Uh, uh, you know, that is, uh, I remember people from a year and a half and two. I remember all my family, everything, but I cannot remember my sister. And when the first time I told it, which was quite a few years ago, I broke down because it was so difficult for me. And it is difficult for me today also, every time I tell this, that I cannot, I don't even, I have no photographs, but I have the photographs of my family in my mind, except for my sister. I was in my Danek for three months and you cannot imagine what i can't i haven't got the time to tell you what kind of a terror went on in that in that camp but i'll give you one example the night that we arrived there i was i was first of all when we, we were chased into a barrack and uh, are dressed naked you know as soon as everybody else was taken and there was a little man with a white coat quite a short man and I suppose he was one of the SS, Gestapo, and he was pushing people right, left, right, left, right, left. And I didn't know what was going on. I thought we were in, in, in Treblinka. I didn't even know where we were. So I came into a room with shower heads and I knew, I knew it from, I knew from uh, Warsaw that there were false shower heads. Gas comes out and you die. So I started saying my prayers. And uh, 
in my case, water came out. And as soon as kind of cold water, and as soon as they saw that you were already uh, washed, they, they didn't give you anything to dry yourself. They chased you into another barrack and they gave you striped clothes and wooden clogs and a striped head. And they chased you out for a roll call. And I was looking for my father because I thought to myself, if, if I am alive, my father must be alive. But I couldn't find him. So I went up to a man. The man, as a matter of fact, it was the man that my father, you know, used to bring in, the one with, the, with, with, with all those boils on his face. And, and I said to him, where is my father? Did you see my father? You know, what, what happening? What's happening? And he didn't answer. And suddenly he raised his eyes to heaven. And I kind of understood that my father wasn't around anymore, that he, that he was, you know, died. So obviously this was a selection. And the first night that I was in the, I rented the barrack in the morning, uh, there were three young men hanging in the rafters. And I thought to myself, they committed suicide. But afterwards I, I was told that the German couples, these were criminals, they did all kinds of things to young people. I must be careful. And, and they murder them. And then they, in the morning when we have a roll call, they tell to the SS that they committed suicide. This was going on in Majdanek. Fortunately for me, after three months, I was selected as a slave laborer to go to a munition factory in a place called Skarzysko. Now Skarzysko was a, was a munition factory that was set up by the Polish government long before the war in an area full of forests, so it could be camouflaged. And the, the Nazis took it over. They sold it to a private concern, Hasak, Hugo Schneider, Axel, Gesellschaft. Hasak was the acronym. And they set up three camps, A, B, and C. C was the worst one, and that's where I came up. But fortunately, again, for me, providentially, I believe in providence. I'm a religious person. I found that uh, the internal administration of the camp was in Jewish hands. In other words, they appointed, like they appointed in, in Warsaw, Judenrat, they appointed the Jewish administration with the Jewish police and a, and a Jewish, uh, 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 you know, kind of whatever they needed to do, Jewish cooks and uh, other things. So um, they, when I arrived, they, they uh, aligned, assigned people to work groups. And I was assigned to a work group run by a Jewish policeman called Ketz. And he asked everybody their name and who they are. So I told him, I, my name is Pinchat Gute. I come from Wuj. He came from Wuj. He knew my family. And the Jewish police and administration, they were very well kept because they were regarded as collaborators. So they had special barracks. They were allowed to have their uh, wives. Some, some of them even had their children. They even had their parents, uh, you know, the grown up parents, you know, grandfathers. And, and they, they had a much better life than we. We were given starving, uh, 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 you know, rations and stuff like that. And we were working for 12 hours a day. But Kat's wife, who was in the police barrack, was, became ill with TB. So she was lying in bed. So Katz told me that if I come back after work and I look after her, I become her nurse. I became a nurse like an hospital. I washed her, I cleaned her, and uh, I tried to give her food. And uh, I did everything for her. And she lived for about six, seven months, you know, while I was doing that. And uh, even after she passed away or died, um, he, he looked after me. And this is why I managed to survived that camp for a whole year because every few weeks there were selections there and if people were looked as if they were kind of very thin and, and not able to work uh, they would actually select them to die take them to the forest there was a sick bay there uh, like a hospital that people used to go if they got sick um, because the work was very hard food was very little and um, what's more uh, they made uh, uh, grenades and mines with, uh, with, uh, with, with different uh, chemicals. One of them was called picrina, which I found after the war was picric acid. And that picric acid would make you yellow. It would go through, affect your lungs, your liver, and your heart. And then after two or three months, most of the people would, would die. 
And even before that, while they were working there, as soon as they couldn't work very well, as I told you, there was election and the, the German uh, foreman, the German engineers would select them and, take, and they would be taken to the forest and, and shot. They, they had huge uh, 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 dug, you know, the, the uh, 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 um, graves and they would just uh, burn them and, 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 and in them. And what's more, they also, in those woods, there were a lot of partisans and also people, Christian Catholics, uh, that were, you know, anti-German. They would uh, bring them there, shoot them, and also burn them in the same pits. And this went on for a whole year. One day, and it was the end of July, it was the end of July of 1944, uh, we came back from work and we were told we must go in front of the office of the German commander. He was actually an Austrian uh, policeman uh, who was, a, uh, he was a, 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 an inspector of police in, in Vienna and then he became a, a, a commander of a concentration camp in, in Skarzysko. And, and we would give our name. And as we came, he gave our name and he made a tick. And then we were chased back into the barrack. We were given our food rations. You know, uh, by that time, they, the rations were better because they didn't, couldn't get any more. There weren't too many Jews, so they could replace them. So they decided that from January of 1944, our rations improved a little bit. So we were doing better. And, uh, and uh, so we, we got our food and went to sleep in the morning at dawn. It was always at dawn we were woken up. We were chased out of the barrack by the Jewish police. And we were st stood in a roll call, waiting for a couple of hours, not going to work. And then the commander, Schultz, his name was, came out with lists on it, with papers in his hand. And he says, I'm going to call out names. And I am, we are evacuating this camp now. We are going further. And you are, every person that's name has been called he must step out and go to the other side because we are evacuating and we haven't got enough rail cars for everybody. So a lot of people will have to go by walk. But those people whose names I call out, they, they are going to be able to go with, 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 with the railways. So he started calling out names. He started calling out, he called out my name. I was in regs. By that time, I had no shoes anymore. Uh, I had paper and with wire on my feet. And, um, and uh, I stood my best friend, you know, you always had to be have a, a good friend. He was a few years older than me. I was still a youngster, very naive. So we helped each other and he called out his name. His name was Jakob and uh, we stood there. Suddenly he called out the name of, of a woman doctor who was like the chief doctor of our, uh, of our camp and uh, a Jewish one. And she had her mother there because she was a prominent person. We used to call them the prominent Jews. And um, he called out the mother. He didn't call out her. So she ran towards Schultz. I don't know what she was saying, but I show him. He, he was, she was pulling at his sleeve and she must have been saying, let me go with my mother. And he kept on pushing her back, pushing her back. He called the mother and he lost his temper, took out his revolver and shot them both on the spot. So we realized, we looked around, we saw that yellow people, uh, people with dregs and everybody, you know, uh, are being called out. And so we ran off because we knew this is now a selection for shooting, for killing, for murdering. So we started running and I, I ran, I didn't want to die. So I, the, the barracks were built on stilts. So I ran, I ran into a barrack, underneath a barrack and I burrowed myself like an animal trying to hide. Of course, the Ukrainians, the SS, the Jewish police were told, you must round up everybody. We were surrounded with barbed wire and we couldn't run out anywhere. So they, and we are going, they were going to be a new roll call. And he now was going to choose he, the people that he wanted to die. And if he had four or 500 on his, on his list of names, he was going to take out 500 and until he took out all the people that he had on the list or thought that he had on the list, he would, he would not let go. And by that time, of course, nobody would give their name. 
again, providentially, the person that found me was Kent. Kent pulled me out from underneath the barrack. He said, there's no good you you're hiding. They're going to find everybody. There's going to be a new roll call, as I told you. And Schultz is going to go from row to row, and they're going to pull out people which he wants them to die. So he took me to the police barrack. He said, let me help you. He took off all my dirty clothes, took off my, the, uh, washed me completely, gave me socks, boots like the police wore, and proper uh, pants, underpants, shirts. I, I was in a jacket and a hat, not a police hat, obviously I wasn't a policeman, but a hat he took, uh, he had left over some lipstick from his wife. He rubbed it into my cheeks and he said, go outside. You will have to be in the roll call. And, you know, with God's help, he won't choose you and you will survive. So we went out. Yaakov stood next to me on the roll call. And because we were youngsters and nobody wants to speak, stay, stay in front, everybody, the grown-ups, the strong ones, would push you to the front. So we stood in the front row. Schultz was going from row to row to row. And he then took out people. By that time, there was a kind of ring of Jewish police, SS, Ukrainians with guns, machine guns. And they, every time he chose somebody, they would take him to that ring, surround it. They were holding their hands like this. And, uh, and, and anybody that tried to run away, they would shoot him on the spot. He came and stood in front of me and looked at me. And I was sure that he recognized me from when I came and gave my name and he was going to take me out, but he didn't. Without looking, he took Yaakov and pushed him into the hands of either an assessment policeman, I don't know. I, I, I didn't even look anywhere. And uh, Yaakov was my best friend. And I, couldn't get over that because I felt that he was a victim, that he was like, a, in Polish they say of Yara, he, he was a, a um, I, I can't find, I, I think I've got many languages and suddenly I've forgotten the English word for it. He, he was a, a, um, a, um, a, a, a korban. How do you say, a, a, um, um, he was a, um, it will come back in a minute. He was a sacrificial lamb. He was, he was being sacrificed on, on my, and he was a sacrifice. He was his sacrifice. And I was, I was the one who was going to be chosen and they chose him as, as, and he was sacrificed because of me. And I grieved this child. I grieved this man who was three or four years older for many, many, many years. And, and, and I used to break down, have nightmares about it. And I think it's time for me to finish now. I went through, uh, after, after, of course, I wasn't chosen, I was sent to another, fact, uh, another concentration camp, and then I went to Germany to Buchenwald. From Buchenwald, I was sent to another concentration camp in Germany called Kolditz, all to do with the same firm that we were slaves, sold by the SS. And then on a death march from Germany to Czechoslovakia to Rennstadt, and I was liberated by the Russians on the 8th of May, 1945. So thank you very much for listening to me. It's not so easy for me to talk on Zoom. It's much easier when I am actually facing an audience, then I don't get so uh, head up and I don't forget things, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, like the word of, for sacrifice, uh, uh, you know, I, I couldn't think of it. I, I, I had it in my mind in different languages, but not in English. So thank you very much for listening. Well, thank you, Pinkas, very much. Such a heartfelt thank you for sharing your story. I'm speaking on behalf of SWC, but I'm sure on behalf of everyone listening today, just hearing you tell your story and the way you tell it, I think we could all even visualize it because you're just, you're so, you're so emotive when you're speaking. So I think you definitely were able to put all of us sort of in that position to experience all of that horror along with you. We want to thank you so much for having the courage and for sharing this with us today. Um, I do have one quick question for you, and I'm not sure if you can perhaps answer it. I, I've got the time, so you can ask as many questions as you want. I do have one. Perfect. I do have one very quick question that I know other people have asked as well. Can you share just a little bit about the Dimensions and Testimony Project, the hologram? 
how that came to be and how you got involved with the hologram project. Well, I have been involved with the Shoah Foundation for some years because I, I, I became very friendly in 98 with what then became, what, what, uh, he wasn't then, but eventually became the chair of the Shoah Foundation of the University of Southern California and uh, Stephen Smith. And one day he came to me and he told me, he was actually in Toronto on a speech. He said that his wife, Heather Mayo, uh, was very concerned that what is going to happen in the future when Holocaust survivors have all passed away and they weren't and they couldn't come and, 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 and share their story in, in, in person. What would happen there? They are testimonies, but these are flat testimonies. People are listening, but you can't interact with them. Is the, so she went to the IC uh, uh, units of the University of Southern California and asked them, do you think you can create a image that can interact and speak and being asked questions? And they didn't laugh at her. She thought they're going to laugh at her. They said, well, let's try. So he asked me, would I be prepared to be the pilot project? In other words, the guinea pig. And I said, of course I will do that. So I went to Los Angeles and uh, I spent one day with these people with some cameras in a little room. They were asking me because they didn't think that the Holocaust survivor would be able to answer, you know, a thousand, uh, two thousand questions and, and all this. So they put me in a little room on a chair. They uh, started asking me a question. It was going to be only one hour. And then we broke up for lunch because it started at 11. We broke up for lunch. And then they stayed the whole for, for, for quite a few hours asking me lots of questions. And spontaneously, I would answer these questions. And they realized that maybe this is a good idea. And they started working on it. It took them a year to develop some kind of software that they could think of doing something with it. And then, so I, I think I went again and just quickly. And then after that, they worked some more. I think it took about, this was about 2014 or something like that. And then they, it took about a year and a half or something like that. And then they said, we can actually do it. So I came there, we can do a trial. So I spent the whole week from nine to five, sitting in a huge sphere with thousands of lights, with 52 cameras and one huge camera and all kinds of computers. And they were working and Stephen Smith was asking me questions because I didn't want to see any questions. They offered to ask, give me questions. I said, I don't want to. I, I, if you're going to ask me a question, I want spontaneously. And so that was a whole week. And I, asked, I answered something uh, because they asked you the same question in different ways because how people might ask it in different ways. So I answered about close to 2,000 questions. And then I went another couple of times because they had to tweak it and, and, and chain it and do this and that and the other. And eventually it was ready to be able to show it to the public. And the first time it was shown to the public was in Skokie in the Holocaust Center in Chicago. And uh, after they finished the three months trial, they invited me and my wife to come and when they closed the day, they closed it. And it was quite fascinating because I never saw it, my own image. And then suddenly I was sitting in the back and, and listening to people asking me questions and get, getting me to sing songs and stuff like that. And it was quite incredible. And I think it's a very important tool uh, in the future of Holocaust. Now they are not only doing it for Holocaust survivors. They've got about, I think, 10 or 12 Holocaust survivors, but they're doing it with uh, people from uh, from uh, uh, from uh, uh, Certainly with Rohingya from Cambodia, they went, I think, they, they from uh, Kosovo, I think, they from all different, you know, genocide, they are trying to take people to have witnesses that can actually interact. And I think interacting with the human being, and you can, it, it's amazing. It's one, it's all kinds of prizes, you know, jury prize, uh, uh, this prize, I got uh, a kind of, uh, there was a documentary in Los Angeles, uh, uh, one of the biggest documentary uh, 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 kind of festivals, and I won the Oscar, documentary Oscar, I've got 
I've got the picture. I, if you hold it a second, I can bring it to you. You want to see it? I'll show it to you. It's a beautiful little thing. It looks like, it looks like, it almost looks like an Oscar. I'm going to bring it to you. For those of you that may not be as familiar, the hologram project, as Pinkas is saying, is exactly that. It's a 3D life-size interactive model of, of Pinkas and other survivors as well that students and groups can actually interact with at museums all across the world. So it really is the future of Holocaust education. Can you see it? Very cool. Can you see it clearly? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, this is, this is what, uh, what I got in 19, this was in, uh, in Los Angeles. Uh, advanced uh, it was in 2018 sorry i'm going to put on my my it was in 2018 and it was uh, uh, the documentary jury prize that is amazing thank you so yeah. much for sharing that with us it really is an incredible project again one more time pinkas i want to thank you so there much you are. For being here it's very cool and i mean it's point, quite a quite thing it's quite quite heavy i'm sure it is it's very cool At but it's not point, gold it's, yeah, it's not gold no well it's not, it could be it's, it's not a golden calf i don't believe in that anyway fair enough i'm going to turn the stage over to our president and ceo michael levitt just to say a couple of closing remarks as well michael the thank you is yours thanks again thanks Pink. daniela pinchas that was um just incredible just incredible so you you I mean, I've, I've heard you talk so many times, but the, the vividness, I mean, I think we're all, I'm watching the comments in the chat uh, area here and everybody's just so moved by the, by the power of, again, uh, what you experienced with your family and, and the description of even that moment when Yaakov was taken away. And, and it just, I think it, it goes right to our souls imagining how you felt. And, and you know what, the fact that you're not just here today with us, you're not just um, working on the Shoah Foundation and the holograms, you're in classrooms across the country. You continue after all these years to just be so engaged um, and, and such an important spokesperson um, for our community, for organization like ours and so many others that understand the absolute um, importance of Holocaust education on our youth. But I wanna point out something that people may not know, and that is how active and engaged you also are on combating anti-Semitism, contemporary anti-Semitism. And I just read an article that you wrote that appeared in the Times of Israel just a few days ago on the IRA definition and the importance of, you know, when Jews are, are being more and more vilified in Canada and around the world, the importance of the IRA definition, particularly in the Canadian political context. And I know you wrote that article as one of the co-chairs of the Canadian Jewish Holocaust survivors and descendants. So um, thank you, just not for your testimony today, but for all you continue to do, standing up for our community, raising your voice and inspiring us. Um, through your story and the story of all the survivors. And I see a number of other survivors here with us this afternoon. Uh, and I just wanna say uh, thank you. I also wanna thank, and I, I'm, Erwin was here the whole time you were talking, but I think he may have just signed off. I wanna thank um, Erwin Kotler and of course, Jeremy and everybody from the Raoul Wallenberg Center. We're so proud um, of the partnership we have with them on this. And as Jeremy was saying, so many other projects, uh, you know, in, including recently um, the plight of the Uyghurs and the genocide they're facing um, in the Xinjiang province in China. Uh, and uh, I, I want to thank our educators at Wiesenthal, Daniela, Elena, Melissa, Jordan, Emily, who continue to work to bring the, the testimony of our survivors into classrooms across the country and, of course, out to audiences uh, like this every two weeks in our In Conversation series. Um, and let me just close with and thank you to all of you who week after week come back to witness these remarkable, remarkable um, hour long testimonies from the survivors. We are so grateful that you join us every two weeks. And uh, I just want to, on behalf of friends of Simon Wiesenthal Center and the Roll Wallenberg Center, thank you all. Pinchas, once again, kolhekavod. Tadaraba.
תודה רבה. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, everybody. Have a wonderful evening. We'll see you two weeks yeah. from today on March 24th for Eva Meisel in conversation with. Have a great night, everybody. Yeah, I hope you all stay well and stay safe. And you get vaccinated. That's important. That is the hope. <laughs> Thanks again, everybody. Bye-bye.